The reason that vitamin D deficiency is so prevalent, um, we'll get to in a minute, but 70% is a lot of people. And the reason I think this is so important to talk about is because the name is a little bit misleading, vitamin D. Well, it's actually much more than a vitamin. So vitamin D3 gets converted into a steroid hormone. So in other words, it goes into the nucleus of our cells and interacts with DNA and it changes the way genes are regulated. So it activates and turns on very important genes, genes that are involved in immune function, brain aging, cognition. And it also turns down and suppresses certain genes. And it does this at a certain with a certain rhythm and a certain timing. And so you can imagine if you're not getting enough vitamin D, there's about a thousand genes that are being affected by that. That's a lot of different processes. And the reason I, I, again, think this is so important is because it really, there's a simple solution here. And it ultimately just means taking a vitamin D supplement. About 4,000 IUs a day can bring most people, there are outliers, but most people up to a sufficient level. I like to start with this slide because we're going to talk about the role of vitamin D in aging. And if you look at the at the mice, that yes, these are mice and we are not mice. And there's a big difference between us and mice. But it does really highlight you know, the role of vitamin D in the aging process. So on the top panel here, the, the mouse on the left is a vitamin D receptor knockout mouse. That means that vitamin D can't act on its receptor because there's no vitamin D receptor there. And therefore, it's like being vitamin D deficient. The mouse on the right is a wild type, wild type mouse. On the bottom panel, those are the same rodents four months later. I mean, the, the vitamin D the receptor knockout mouse is like an accelerated model for aging. The skin starts to wrinkle, the hair fell out, its bones get brittle, it starts to get organ dysfunction. So it's accelerating the aging process, even in rodents. And for us, I mean, if you think about vitamin D being a hormone activating over 5% of the protein encoding human genome, that's a large percentage of, you know, important physiological processes that are not working optimally. And it's a really simple solution, right? We know that vitamin D3 also plays a role in the way um, human humans age and disease risk. And so there's many, many, many studies, I mean, countless studies out there finding an association between low vitamin D levels and increased all-cause mortality risk, increased cancer mortality risk, you know, increased disease risk, essentially. And one might say, well, that's an association. People that are vitamin D deficient are just overall not healthy. Maybe they're not going outside and exercising as much, right? You can find all these reasons why you might say, eh, that's probably not causation, right? That's where we turn to Mendelian randomization. So we use genetics to look at vitamin D deficiency. So Mendelian randomization looks at genes and um, it basically can find like variations in genes. And then you can sort of use that as a randomized controlled trial to look at outcomes because we all are different. We have different variations of genes and there are a variety of different genes that are involved in vitamin D3 metabolism into the active steroid hormone. Some people have variations in a couple of those genes that make enzymes where they're not converting vitamin D3 into 25-hydroxy vitamin D3 or the active steroid hormone very well. And so you can say, okay, I'm going to look at those people with those genes, and then I'm going to look at their mortality rate. It turns out if you look at genetically low vitamin D levels with actually not even having to look at their vitamin D levels, we know those people have low vitamin D from other studies. They have the genes that make them have genetically low vitamin D. They do have an increased all-cause mortality risk. They have an increased cancer mortality risk, and they have an increased respiratory um, mortality risk compared to people without the, those different variations in those vitamin D related enzymes. So I think that's more causal evidence. And it really just goes hand in hand with the observational data, giving you more of a totality of evidence to say, hey, vitamin D sufficiency is important for reducing disease risk and for reducing all cause mortality. We also know from um, there's, this is just one study I'm showing you here, but there's also other studies that have repeated this and confirmed this finding where people who are vitamin D deficient, in this case, they were overweight and obese African-Americans. African-Americans are oftentimes the most vitamin D deficient, particularly if they're living in a place in a more northern latitude because they do have a natural sunscreen, which is called melanin. And so if they're not, in fact, there's a study out of the University of Chicago, this was published in like 2009, it found that African-Americans have to spend 
almost between six to 10 times longer in the sun to make the same amount of vitamin D3 subcutaneously in their skin as Caucasians. And that is because they have a natural sunscreen. So um, this study found that these African-Americans that were overweight and obese, if they supplemented supplemented them with 4,000 IUs a day for a few weeks and then measured their epigenetic age. So epigenetic aging is another way to kind of look at your biological age. There's certain epigenetic factors, methylation patterns that occur with age. And scientists can just look at those methylation patterns and they can identify, you know, how old you are either chronologically or sometimes people are so healthy, they look biologically younger than their chronological age, or you'll find that they look older. Um, in this case, the people that were vitamin D deficient, deficient looked older. And after their 4,000 IUs of supplementation, it reversed their epigenetic aging by almost two years. So in other words, not being vitamin D deficient, just m- making sure you correct that deficiency really has a profound effect on your DNA epigenetic aging. So I think that's also really important to keep in mind. I also mentioned this is not the only study that's shown that. Vitamin D also plays a very important role in cognitive aging as well. So, you know, 5% of the protein encoding in human genome, many of these genes are involved in cognition, neurotransmitter synthesis. Clotho, you may have heard of Clotho. So Clotho is a very important gene for cognition. There are studies showing that people that have variations of Clotho that makes make it more active are protected against Alzheimer's disease and dementia. They also are smarter for some reason. So um, it plays a role in cognition. Vitamin D deficiency is associated with dementia risk. Again, observational data, correlation, many, many, many studies out there. When we look at the genetic studies, so just the observational studies alone where you're actually measure, measuring vitamin D deficiency, it increases dementia risk by 80%. When you turn to the genetic studies to confirm, are we really looking at causation here? You see that risk is about 50%, 54%, which is still pretty strong. If you're vitamin D deficient and that's increasing your dementia risk by, you know, 54% and all you have to do is take a vitamin D3 supplement to correct that deficiency, sounds like a pretty good bang for your buck, right? And then we also have data um, these are all separate studies showing that people that supplement with vitamin D, not only don't they don't have an increased dementia risk, they have a 40% reduced dementia risk. And that's really what you want to see. You want to see all the data pointing in the right direction, right? And that's what we're seeing with vitamin D and dementia. We also know that there are studies showing vitamin D deficiency does structurally accelerate brain aging. So people that are vitamin D deficient often have what are called white matter hyperintensities. Um, these are sort of, uh, when you look by fMRI, at, you know, the brain, they show up as little white spots. And it's, it's damage to the white matter in your brain. You really don't want those. There's studies showing that for every 10 nanomole per liter increase in serum vitamin D levels, there's a decrease in these white matter hyperintensities. So that's also pretty strong data because it's a dose-dependent effect that you're seeing. And there's even more strong evidence when we look at actual randomized controlled trials. So there have been two large trials done with people either with mild cognitive decline or actually Alzheimer's disease. In both cases, they were given a pretty low dose, to be honest, of vitamin D3. It was about almost 1,000 IUs. is 900 IUs of vitamin D3. These individuals were obviously older adults, probably severely deficient in vitamin D. In the Alzheimer's disease trial, so these patients were given either the 800 IUs of vitamin D3 or a placebo for a year, and the vitamin D3 improved cognition in the individuals given it, given it um, and also lowered markers of amyloid beta. So amyloid beta is you know, part of the disease pathology of Alzheimer's disease. So it lowered and improved biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease, including amyloid beta. In the, in the mild cognitive decline trial, something similar was found. Uh, it was also a year long, and patients were given either the 800 IUs of vitamin D3 or they were given placebo. And those individuals also improved their cognition after given vitamin D for a year. So it's pretty strong evidence that not only is vitamin D3 important for preventing Alzheimer's disease, but if you already have it, making sure you're avoiding deficiency also helps because it's improving cognition and lowering some of these markers of um, Alzheimer's disease. There's a variety of mechanisms by which 
vitamin D3, you know, is improving cognition, as I mentioned, you know, lots of genes going on, but it has, it is known to play a role in clearing amyloid beta, immune function as well, that, you know, neuroinflammation plays a big role in dementia and Alzheimer's disease, and vitamin D is very important for inflammation control and sort of preventing some of that, you know, inflammatory, inflammaging effects that happen as we age. And also, I mentioned, you know, plays a role in neurotransmitter synthesis, neuroplasticity, as well as supporting mitochondrial health. So a lot of different mechanisms here that people can dive into. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it all comes down to you have to get your vitamin D levels measured, 25-hydroxy vitamin D, that's the stable circulating form. You can do it Anywhere, any clinician, you can do online tests now and they'll send you a kit. I mean, it's so easy to do. It's pretty cheap. And that's the best way to know what your vitamin D levels are, even after you supplement to make sure you're getting the right dose. I mentioned 20 nanograms per milliliter or less is deficient. If you're if you're between, you know, 21 and 30, then you're considered to be, if you're sorry, 21 and 29, you're considered to be inadequate. So if you're below 30, that's still inadequate. You really want to be above 30. And ideally, you want to be like 40 to 60 or even to 80 nanograms per milliliter, because many studies show those are the blood levels associated with the lowest all-cause mortality. There's about 30 different studies that have been done and a meta-analysis over the course of the like 30 years or so showing that between you know 40 to 60 to 80 nanograms per milliliter is a really good spot to be. And 4,000 IUs a day will get you there. So that's, again, the simple solution, vitamin D supplement.